Welcome to the Center for African and African American Studies event commemorating the March on Washington and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And now for our speaker today, we have the good fortune of having with us Dr. Walter Fluker, who is the founder of Walter Earl Fluker and Associates. He serves as Dean's Professor of Spirituality, Ethics, and Leadership at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. He is the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Ethical Leadership Emeritus at Boston University. He's the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project and director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Initiative for Development of Ethical Leadership. He was founding executive director of the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership and the Coca-Cola Professor of Leadership Studies at Morehouse College. He's known as an expert in theory and practice of ethical leadership and has held positions on numerous committees and boards, including the National Selection Committee for US News and World Reports, America's Best Leaders, the Board of Liberal Education, He's been a consultant and workshop leader for organizations such as the Department of Education and Goldman Sachs Global Leadership Program. Please join me in welcoming to Virtual Rice, Dr. Walter Fluker. Thank you, Anthony, and all of my hosts, the uh, steering committee in particular, and uh, in this inaugural year of the Center for African American Studies at Rice, I'm just absolutely delighted to be with you on this very special day. In the interest of time, uh, I'd like to, uh, as they say, jump into the water. Uh, I'm speaking today from the idea or the title of speaking from sites reserved for the dead lingering memories of Martin Luther King Jr. and the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago. Remember Langston Hughes who said, I am the American heartbreak, the rock on which freedom stumped its toe, the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago. As we gather with so many other commemorations of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of 57 years ago in the aftermath of the 401st anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in Jamestown, Virginia, this lecture will reflect on the role of long memory in creating sites of mourning for prophetic speech and action in contested democratic spaces. According to historians, uh, the late John Blassingame and Mary Frances Berry, long memory interrogates traditional narratives of African-American history and utilizes the material evidence left by the people themselves. In order to reveal the complexities of Black experience and to dispel the that African Americans are rootless people without any sense of continuity with their African past. Long memory invites us to revisit places where we remember, retell, and relive our long story of an African past, and to relive the story of African and trauma, to investigate what the late cultural historian Sterling Stuckey called lingering memories of home in the minds of African slaves. These we'll look at as sites of mourning for prophetic speech and action in an era, again, of contested democratic space. So as we get started, it is important to think together about long memory during the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream for America, 
because the Enlightenment project, the rise of modernity and the transatlantic slave trade are inextricably linked and therefore complicit in the erasure of memory and history as this week's events testify. Consider the Republican National Convention's calls for law and order, the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and the double homicide of two protesters by a 17-year-old white vigilante. Yes, these testify to the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago. To treat King's speech as a singular or isolated event in the long annals of Western history is to sanitize and assimilate it into the narrative of progress, which conceals and sanitizes the tragedy and horror of Black existence. As we witness the emergence of new activist leaders here and abroad, we must indeed embrace King's historic speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, but we must also look backwards and beyond his dream of 1963 to his vision of the World House and its call for an expanding, expanded mapping of the world. We must reflect on how this metaphor of the world house encourages us to think of it as a counter geography that extends boundaries beyond the nodes of Africa and the United States of America to include other colonized and exiled peoples of the world. The existential and ethical issues at stake in this new moment in which we find ourselves demand that we congregate, conjure, and conspire about the ways in which this new possibility might be actualized. I have a dream. On August 28, 1963, a massive crowd of over 250,000 pilgrims congregated at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial to hear a long list of speakers address the theme of the march, which was jobs and freedom. But by far the most eloquent and memorable address was 34-year-old Martin Luther King Jr.'s articulation of his dream of community in America. His speech, in this speech, he referred to the theme that his forebearers and he had been rehearsing since the arrival on these shores. That theme has and will always be, he said, we just want to be free. From the beginning of the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama on December 1955, King argued that the democratic principles inherent in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution had been grossly ignored in regard to American citizens of color. The Emancipation Proclamation of Lincoln, said King, had become a great beacon of light, of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. But 100 years later, the Negro was still not free. In fact, King said the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself, I would add herself, in exile in his own land. America had written the Negro a bad check by reneging on the sacred promises written in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which guaranteed to all its citizens the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The dream of which he spoke was rooted in the American dream, 
that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women were created equal. The vision enunciated in this speech was at once communitarian and iconoclastic, for it called into community in America persons from every class, religion, and race and suggested that the freedom of humanity is bound to the destiny of America. King, you remember says, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and from every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we're free at last. King's American dream was rooted in a long-standing tradition of African-American religion and culture that is based upon the fundamental belief that all persons have inherent worth and dignity and as acts of divine creation, they are therefore bound by the moral obligation to create and share space with others. From his earliest public address at Holt Street Baptist Church in Montgomery until his last public sentences on April the 3rd, 1968, at the Mason Temple Church of God in Christ headquarters in Memphis, Tennessee, King saw the struggles of oppressed people around the world as inextricably bound to the struggle for democratic space among African Americans in the U United States. The tradition which gave birth to King's vision of democratic space is best articulated by the old Negro spiritual. You might recall, plenty good room, plenty good room. In the midst of bondage and living in a world that was too crowded to grant them citizenship rights and the dignity of full humanity, these black and unknown bards of long ago envision a world where there was plenty good room. Some remember the song, plenty good room, plenty good room, Plenty good room in my father's kingdom, plenty good room, plenty good room. Choose your seat and sit down. The song expresses the sense of dignity and self-respect that these enslaved Africans knew to be theirs despite the annihilation of space and the reordering of time for the black body. Like the image of expanded space in this old spiritual king believed that there was plenty good room in america for the poor and the disenfranchised peoples of the world for him democratic space had to do with the right to dissent but he also believed that the right to dissent has its basis in the fundamental respect afforded to others because of our shared humanity create sharing democratic space based on human dignity was, was deeply rooted in religious and philosophical convictions that are best understood within the historical context of struggle against racial oppression and domination in the United States and among colonized peoples of the world. The recognition of human dignity and freedom in the tradition represented by King means that there is plenty good room in the United States, or as the late historian John Hope Franklin called it, the land of room enough. Plenty good room during this strange period of American history that is returning to a time that we thought we had bypassed. We're witnessing a reversal of a time, time indeed, that I sometimes call 
American post-post racism, a return to the language of America first, and let's make America great again, a reconfiguration of time and history that harkens back to an ugly past where black, brown, and poor people of all genders and sexualities in this country were assigned seats to what Juanima Luviano called the house that race built. But King and those noble souls who forged the modern civil rights movement, like their ancestors, refused to believe that there was not enough room for them in the United States of America. And so they chose their seats and sat down in defiant acts of courage in spite of the indignities hurled against them. Martin Luther King Jr.'s perspectives on the civil rights movement, I want to suggest were always global. But during his later years, his statements about our connectedness with neighbors around the globe grew more pronounced. King believed that before full citizenship in this country could be achieved, there would need to be a reckoning with Western imperialism's own presuppositions about power. Before his tragic death in 1968, King reminded this nation that we're no longer citizens of a small house. We no longer live in, in a small house that race built, but rather we have inherited a large world house. He suggested in clear and strident language that we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or die apart as fools. King was acutely aware of the need for a broader interpretive framework for the understanding of what he perceived as a crucial passage in history. He suggested that the struggles of African Americans must be understood in light of a shifting of the West's basic outlooks and philosophical presuppositions about power. King argued, and you'll recall, we have inherited a large house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, Black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interests, who, because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live together with each other in peace. However deeply American Negroes, he added, are caught in the struggle to be at last home in our homeland of the United States, we cannot ignore the larger world house in which we are also dwellers. Equality with whites, will not solve the problems of either, either whites or Negroes if it means equality in a world society stricken by poverty and in a universe doomed to extinction by war. It was during his last year, as his vision for the search of the beloved community began to mature and reached its zenith, that King asked the difficult but necessary question, where do we go from here? His question was a signal to African-Americans and other marginalized groups that their liberative claims and practices would need to extend beyond the restricted boundaries of US geopolitical and capitalist interest. His query was also an interrogation of the promised land of freedom and opportunity and the precarity of ghostly non-democratic performances in neoliberal political and economic constructions of race, religion, and the culture of violence and death that persist in our contemporary context. 
king had come to a place in his thinking in which he understood more clearly the dynamic tensions at work between poverty, racism, and war within American society and their relationship to the exploitation of the poor and the powerless around the globe. Shortly before his assassination in Memphis, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had planned a poor people's campaign to converge upon Washington, D.C. in April of 1968 and to demonstrate nonviolently in massive civil disobedience until Congress acted to alleviate the abject poverty around the nation. King felt that such a national confrontation with the federal government by a multiracial coalition of thousands of poor people would symbolically demonstrate the class-based economic and social discrimination inherent in national policy. We've revived that notion with Bishop William Barber's new campaign for the poor people that will also sit in in Washington. King also argued that the national policy of discrimination against the poor and ethnic minorities was but a microcosm of the nation's foreign policy, which was most dramatically illustrated in the Vietnam War. In King's words, the war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a deeper, a far deeper malady within the American spirit. It was King's position that the problems of poverty, race, and violence within the United States are global in scope, and therefore, I quote, inseparable from an international emergency, which involves the poor, the dispossessed, and the exploited of the whole world, end of quote. His dream of a multiracial ethnic America and a reconstructed world order cost him dearly. Tragically, he paid with his life. That was part one. Take a breath with me. Speaking from places reserved for the dead. No examination of Black life and practices, including King, can escape what Cornel West calls the tragic character of Black existence. African Americans in the United States have gone through tumultuous, horrific, traumatizing experiences that continue into the present. Yet it is a tribute to the genius and resilience of a people who made a way out of no way and survived by negotiating the tragic and the transcendent, the melancholic and the hopeful, the despair and the faith that the dark past has taught us. These ancestors, both in the near and from the dry so long past, speak to the fragility and creativity of the human spirit and its offerings to us at this historical impasse where we are forced to rethink what this precious and precarious experiment in democracy means for all of us, especially for the poor and disinherited. One cannot begin to get an adequate sense of the noble tradition from which Martin Luther King Jr. emerged without attention to the long lingering memories that reach back to the transatlantic slave trade and the mistake made in Jamestown long ago. In order to honor this long memory, we must join King and others who are congregating at Lincoln Memorial today and speaking from sites reserved for the dead. Speaking from places reserved for the dead refers to the social, political, cultural spaces from which those most concerned about the surveillance and silencing of the majority of the world's peoples through technologies of death must speak and act in order to that those whom Jacques Ranzier called the part of those that have no part 
may also speak and share in expanding spaces of freedom and equity with others. Unless we're totally asleep, most of us are deeply aware that we're in the midst of a culture of death, a world enshrouded in death, the death march of the pandemic, the death march against affordable health care, the death sentence to millions of displaced refugees around the globe, the deathly reactions of our toxic natural environments, the death dealing pronouncements of wars and rumors of wars, the dead zones of urban battlefields, the deadly erection of legal and material barriers to immigrants, the death cages of incarcerated human beings, the deadly spread of opioids in the rust belt, old mill towns of New England, and the hillbilly elegies of Appalachia, the deathly blood and soul rallying cry of neo-Nazis and the ideological death traps of Christian fantasia throughout the hard lands of America who want their country back. Speaking from spaces reserved for the dead also refers to ways in which our prophetic speech and action are related to the memorialization of natural, national shrines and historical moments where we remember and mourn our dead and experiences of loss. In the remembering and mourning of our dead, we are called to reframe and relive those experiences in the present. Much of what we are witnessing in existing and new constructions of memorials around the nation are what French historian Pierre Nora calls sites of memory. Memorials for Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Omri, Rashad Brooks, Sandra Bland, Jacob Blake, and so many others right now are sites of memory. We must therefore learn to speak from these spaces inhabited by the living dead as part of our ongoing social and political missions in order to disrupt the categorization and binary symbols of blackness versus whiteness, male versus female, gay, straight, citizen, non-citizen, American, non-American, and provide a middle way of speaking from this spectral space to the possibilities of our future. In doing so, as Sharon Patricia Holland writes, we create a plethora of tensions within and without existing cultures. Embracing the subjectivity of death allows marginalized peoples to speak about the unspoken to name the places within and without their cultural milieu where they have slipped, she says, between the cracks of language. What might it mean on this great day to slip between the cracks of language? It means first that the social construction of our known world is rooted in long and aggregated histories where language both signs and covers, and therefore demands that we discover the hidden and invisible artifices of history and memory. Moreover, slipping through the cracks of language of progress means that we learn to reconfigure or conjure new signs and symbols for this time as we mourn at sites reserved for the dead. I'll offer two brief examples that illustrate my point. Two years ago, my beloved and I were facilitators in seminar that visited the modern civil rights movement in Birmingham, Selma, Alabama, all important spaces where memory indeed crystallizes and secretes its into the present and makes us more conscious of where we are in the present and what our moral obligations as citizens demand of us. 
The Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama established one of the sites on April the 26th, 2018, the Peace and Justice Memorial. The site commemorates the more than 4,400 African-American men, women, and children who were hanged, burned alive, shot, drowned, and beaten to death by white mobs between 1877 and 1950. This national lynching memorial, as it is called, is described as a sacred space for truth telling and reflection about racial terror in America and its legacy. One of the 800 hanging Corton weathered steel blocks at this site on which are inscribed the names of the victims of racial terror commemorates 23 African-Americans who were lynched one day, March 7th, 1886, in Carroll County, Mississippi. This particular block was brought to my attention by one of the participants in our group who had heard me mention that I was born in Vaden, Mississippi, a small town in Carroll County. He said, there is something you need to see. And indeed, I did see, touch, hear, and feel. The long lingering memories of an ancestral past that had been hidden from me, which make the then Mississippi Senator-elect Sidney Hyatt Smith's November 11, 2018 remarks that if Donald Trump invited me to a public hanging, I'd be on the front row. Even more, this makes it more shocking and reprehensible. Another example of what is at stake in slipping through the cracks of language and conjuring new signs and language at sites of memory was the 400 year commemoration of activities at Jamestown, Virginia, one year ago. In his celebrated poem, American Heartbreak, Langston Hughes signifies on the mythology of progress that undergirds American democracy and its founding at Plymouth Rock in 1620. The poet writes, I am the American heartbreak, the rock on which freedom stomped its toe, the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago. Hughes' allusion to the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago is a critique of the national imaginary and founding myth of American democracy. In late 1619, one year before the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, the first cargo of 20 and odd Africans boarded an English ship called the White Lion and landed in Jamestown, a British colony. The contradiction signified by the mistake of Jamestown is symbolized by the colony's participation in the transatlantic slave trade only 10 years after its founding in 1609. These 20 and odd Africans were part of a larger Atlantic slave trade that involved at least eight regional entities in the New World, Angola, Portugal, Spain, Holland, England, Mexico, Jamaica, and Virginia. The Atlanta slave trade was over a century old by the time it reached the Americas. So this small group of slaves from Angola constituted the first group of 450,000 who would be shipped from Africa to the United States over the entire course of the slave trade. What was the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago? Well, a mistake can be read in different ways. A mistake can be an error in action, calculation, opinion, or judgment caused by poor reasoning, carelessness, insufficient knowledge, or it can be a mistake. A stick or a post pointed at one end for driving into the ground as a boundary mark, part of a fence support for a plant that is used for malicious ends, mis 
state. I'm reading Hughes's declaration of the Jamestown mistake in the latter sense as a boundary mark used for malicious ends. In this case, for staking out ill-gotten territory, the reconfiguration and reordering of space and time for colonized subjects throughout the new world. I understand the attendant European scramble for Africa between 1881 and World War I in 1914 along the same lines. The British, French, Germans, Portuguese, Belgians, Italians, and Spanish were engaged in mistaking, invading, occupying, colonizing, worlding, and annexing African territory. The way of thinking about the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago has to do to, with the ways in which sites of memory allow us to think about how the geography of race and ethnicity was organized by the modernist project and signals to us ways in which we interpret Martin Luther King Jr.'s language of dreaming and the metaphor of the great world house as a call for reparations and an expanded remapping of the world and as a counter geography that extends boundaries beyond Africa and the Americas to include other colonized and exiled peoples. My good friend Yale theologian Willie James Jennings argument in the Christian imagination is rooted in this division of the African spoils among European powers, many of which were locations for modernist progressive democratic narratives. He argues that Europeans in their colonial conquest performed, I quote, a deeply theological act that mirrored the identity and action of God in creating, end of quote in which they transitioned and reconfigured land and territory as part of the domain of the project of whiteness. Jenning adds, I quote, theorists and theories of race will not touch the ground until they reckon with the foundations of racial imaginings in the, in the deployment of an altered theological vision of creation. We must narrate, he says, not only the alteration of bodies, but of space itself. Re-narrating space for historically marginalized and colonialized people, those damaged by the relentless desire for power, goods, and bodies, is more than a reformulation of a discursive formation of language. Rather, it's a project of mourning the dead, a deeply emotional, effective, and aesthetic remaking of the self in the world. How, I ask on this day, do we return to these spaces reserved for the dead and allow our mourning to be translated into active, deliberate speech and action? It begins with grieving our dead. We have really grieved our dead. You cannot speak from a platform at a Republican convention unless you're able to grieve the dead. You might mention Black people, but unless there's an effective dimension, one has missed the point. My good friend Maladoma Patrice Somay has written that the great need in Western civilization is for ritualized grief. Modernism means unemotionalism, he writes, or that which owes emotion to the world. It also means loss of memory of the way of acting that encompasses both the body and the soul. To cleanse the modern world from its unresolved problems of the soul ought not, he writes, to be a memorial day, but a massive funeral day when everyone is expected to share tears for the titanic loss wrecked by progress on people's souls. 
On this day, as we remember King's historic speech of 1963, we must also remember the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago and begin the task of re-narrating creation embedded in progressive narr narratives that hide, conceal, and perpetuate the imperialist project of colonization and the white supremacist heteronormative assault expressed in racial, gender, and sexual oppression. We must mourn our dead. In order to mourn our dead, we are called to grieve, speak, feel, and act from sites reserved for the dead as epistemic material sources in the task of re-narrating creation, which I think requires congregating, conjuring, and conspiring and imagining the boundaries erected by territorialism and finding appropriate language in our 21st century context. What might that social, political, and cultural task involve? I suggest in what follows, that we must sit with and excavate the memories of those who are still near to us in time, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, and hold them in tension with the dry, so long, lingering memories that are also dangerous memories. Part three and it's done. Are you ready? Do you need a breath? Okay. Martin Luther King Jr.'s American dream and his notion of the world house are dangerous memories. Thus, I'm inviting us on this Memorial Day to return to King's dangerous memories as imaginative sites where we begin our work of slipping through the cracks of language and re-narrating the Eurocentric narrative of democratic space that has alienated, reconfigured, and dismissed the wretched of the earth. This understanding of the world house as a metaphor for expanding the boundaries of U.S. territorialism is linked to King's vision of democratic space. His concern was to inscribe a new geography where the Atlantic nexus of Euro-American power no longer dominated through his geopolitical interests, nor by what we now know as neoliberal constructions of capital around the globe. At stake in this vision are ethical questions regarding how neoliberalism ideologically, structurally, and strategically co-ops traditional norms and values that have created what Peter Bloom calls the ethical capitalist subject that rests on a permanent profit maximizing individualism. Martin Luther King Jr. presently alluded to this rising problem as the structural gulf between the haves and the have nots in his 1964 Nobel Peace Prize lecture as the basis for poverty around the globe. Joshua F. J. Inwood, an associate professor of cultural geography, suggests that King's vision calls for an expanded mapping of the world and encourages us to think of the world house as a kind of counter geography that extends boundaries beyond the nodes of Africa and the Americas to include unionized and exiled peoples. King called this moral remapping of the globe perspective or a world of geographical oneness. And he says we're challenged now to make it a spiritual one. King's notion of the great world house as expanding democratic space, I think is an appropriate ethical ideal for the new moment to which we have been called by history and opportunity. Recent U.S. military confrontations with peaceful protesters and immigrants seeking asylum in the U.S. only dimly forecast what is at stake when the recurring rhetoric and rising fascist masquerades to build walls to keep the stranger out gain ascendancy among a growing percentage of American citizens. Vision is also an efficacious catalyst for the possibility for a new global peace 
and ecological movement because embedded in its very image are the twin notions of diasporas and exiles as suggested by Inwood. In an earlier work, I referenced the ethical obligations of the world house that involve new and creative ways of communication and modeling global citizenship among exiles and diasporas, among scattered and scattering people. The existential and ethical issues at stake in this moment, I suggest, demand that we congregate, conjure, and conspire about ways in which this new possibility is actualized. Critical to this conversation are the questions of equity and justice for the poor that exist beyond the boundaries of nation states whose lives are in perpetual states of air transition wrought by the conjunct surges of globalization and neoliberalism that have created a new form of capitalist inquisition what the scholar Amy Chua labels as a world on fire. She argues that the exportation of free market democracy breeds ethnic hatred and global instability and caters to a new elite of market dominated minorities who profit most from globalization rather than the ethnic poor and the politically powerless in the world. The late Toni Morrison spoke of this scattering in terms of a search for home. Where might these diaspora and exile aliens in search of home find democratic spaces, the new geography, the new world house of which King prophesied? It begins first, I think, with the, the acknowledgement that the ground has indeed shifted. And as we are witnessing a new generation of leaders emerge bearing the mantle of prophetic speech and action from spaces reserved for the dead. Yet ultimately their quest for home will not necessarily be in their spaces or places of national origin, nor in the deracinated spaces of national allegiances and loyalties. These new citizens of the world must assume the new time and embody the new spaces wrought by a global citizenship that seeks justice in a new global community of plenty good room. The dangerous memory of Dr. King's World House will make some people uneasy, especially those who are involved in the transactional leadership we see every day here conducting business as usual, and who suggests that we can govern by making deals with oligarchs and plutarchs and plutocrats. As we experience the utter pillage and plunder of our most cherished ideals of democracy and the attendant ambiguities and concerns of our nation's future, the vision of the World House of Martin Luther King Jr is no longer the distant imaginings of a utopian dreamer, but may be the only viable option for peaceful coexistence in this nation and on this planet. As we wit witness the shifting grounds of change in our nation and abroad, we must ask new questions about the nature of our long journey on these shores. We must ask, what does this new season of struggle for us, for educators, for essential, quote unquote, essential workers and the world? Can we create democratic space for others? Is there indeed plenty good room for everybody? To quote Rodney King, can we all get along? There we hope, or must we conclude with those who say that we're at the end of history? King did not think we were at the end of history. King believed that what we are witnessing and continue to witness is a worldwide revolution that challenges the very foundations of Euro-Western hegemony, 
In his last public sentences, King said that he was pleased to live during this chaotic and precarious because beyond the despair and hopelessness that abounded, he believed that his was a great moment for the united struggles of the peoples throughout the world. He declared, and I close, I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And King in his religious language says, and I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men, I would add women, in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of the people are rising up. And wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Venezuela, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, huh, Hong Kong, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee. The cry is always the same. We just want to be free. Thank you, my friends, for listening to a long, long speech on a long, long day. I'm open for conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Flucker. Uh, just as you were uh, ending your talk and quoting uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, a thunder sounded here in Houston. So it was a nice <laughs> way to consider it. <laughs> Apocalyptic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe, you know, a, a breath of hope there. Let's see. Uh, this is the time for uh, answer uh, questions and answer. Uh, we are uh, already a little bit over time, so maybe uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the audience, you can shoot your questions through the Q&A box. Uh, as they type, I, I have a, here uh, uh, one question already from Naomi Carrier. How might reparations fuel the economy and stimulate reconciliation and healing, in your opinion? How might, would you state that again? How might reparations Reparations feel account for economy. healing. Yes, reparations both is uh, is both a symbolic and a very practical action. Uh, I think of reparations in those two ways. One is I'm definitely in favor of economic reparations for Black people, for African Americans in this country along the same line that, lines that we've seen for Jewish members of the Holocaust, for Japanese Americans who were sent to internment camps, I'm very much in favor. The symbolic significance, however, is, 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 even, is as important, maybe even more in some respect. How do we account for, quote unquote, the sins of our fathers? When I use the language of mourning, I didn't want to bore you with philosophical language and details, but I'm also thinking about inheritance. Uh, or when I say conjuring, I'm thinking of uh, a longer um, etym etym etymological understanding of conjurating. We must swear an oath in this country that we will, it ought to be public, that we will make good on what we've done to people of African descent. And of course, that list could be expanded. Uh, the symbolic significance, I think, would bring about part of the healing. But that would be preceded by acknowledging the grief, the deep-seated grief that is necessary to bring about the hope and a new possibility. I'm not always hopeful. Uh, I'm not pessimistic, but I'm certainly not always hopeful uh, that this country will have the moral fiber fortitude to do that. 
but I think it's essential that we continue to place before the American people the need for reparations as a pre-step, as a prelude to healing. Thank you. Uh, now I have a, a question from my, a teacher, uh, Annie Lau, and uh, she was wondering here if you could speak how humanism, traditional, contemporary, or and or radical, and the cultural practices, artifacts, and critical thought that the humanities values and studies can help teenagers reflect on and respond to the ongoing trauma in their own neighborhood. Mm. Boy, this is such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful question. Certainly for educators. Um, I joked with our team the other day, they I always have this cross behind me. I happen to be a Christian ordained minister, but the cross for me isn't about to propitiate propitiation of my sins. Uh, it's there as a reminder of what it means to be human and the cause to bring about a new kind of humanity. Um, part of the work of educators is to point to certainly literary, but also material sources that ground our sense of what constitutes human. Years ago, I was director, founding director of the Leadership Center at Morehouse College. And I would actually, each year, we had uh, Oprah Winfrey gave us a very wonderful gift, but we would take young Morehouse students to South Africa to work in the midst of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And they were allowed to work with the health workers and they would spend their month in South Africa side by side with the health workers, visiting people, emptying uh, bed pots and pans and caring for those who were suffering. I dare say um, those young men returned to this country with a very different understanding of what it meant first to be human, but what it meant to use those spaces as epistemic sites for knowledge, for learning. And of course, we would exchange with South African students who would come to this country and make new discoveries about the plight of African Americans. But in order for a new generation of leaders to come forth, I think, Part of that will be certainly pointing to literary, traditional uh, pedagogies that we use in our schools, but so much has to be with visiting and being alongside others who suffer. Humanity is really, on most days, about deep suffering. That is, if you live in the world with the rest of us. Thank you. Uh, just one uh, last question from our online audience. Uh, William Lester is asking, in relation to Jewish communities and the economics, is it realistic that we can truly gain true freedom without the liberation of the African continent from neocolonialism? It seems land and freedom are instinctively tied to those with land and economic prowess have benefited most. So is it really possible, I'm hearing the question, I wanna make sure that mm -hmm. I'm possible or practical to think of the liberation of the African continent as part of a larger movement of reparations? Is that the gist of the question? No, so the gist is, uh, can, we, can we gain freedom, true freedom, without the liberation of African continent from neocolonialism? No, uh, that's an easy uh, response for me, but it also is a, a very complex issue. 
Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. made a statement. Uh, the late King is the king to watch. I keep telling students. <laughs> king says, King says during his nightmare, not the American dream, but the American nightmare for King, he says that if Israel and South Africa would divest of their uh, capitalist enterprises in Africa, we could bring the entire apartheid system to its knees. That was the dangerous king. That's the dangerous memory. And so, yes, uh, of course, uh, is it, will it bring real human freedom? Well, that's a longer philosophical question. But it certainly would make a whole lot of folks in the world feel better and live better. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Flucker. I really appreciate uh, your, your talk, your answers, and just you know, having this uh, wonderful conversation. I will leave to thank you, Daniel. Tony Pinto concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Again, we apologize for the technical difficulties, but thank you for joining us. I hope you got as much out of the lecture and the Q&A as I did. Um, until we see you next time, be safe, be well.